Good evening. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Ray Grassi, and the name of the talk tonight is The Astrological Outlook for the United States Rebirth or Revolution. A couple of things to start with I have to point out. One is that due to the COVID distancing, uh, we're, I'm speaking here to an empty room, which is a little bit of an unusual, uh, surreal experience. But there won't be any questions and answers afterwards, unfortunately. And I'm also pre-recording this a few days before the broadcast date due to a scheduling conflict. Um, I'm doing this on Monday the 9th. And as we have seen, a lot can happen in a few days in the news. So it's possible by the time this broadcast, there will be some changes in the news that might impact on uh, what we're talking about here. What I'd like to talk about here is the way there has been an awful lot of turbulence in the world lately, obviously, a lot of changes, not just uh, locally, but uh, around the world. And I remember going to an astrology conference a few years ago in which a speaker talked about the 2020s as the roaring 2020s because there were so many turbulent energies happening in the skies uh, throughout this decade. But it does seem to be focusing in particular in some ways anyway, on the United States. And that's because of something we call the Pluto return. Now let me explain what that is. If you see here, this is a chart for the United States. It's one that a lot of astrologers use. I don't particularly use one particular horoscope for the United States. I think it's like saying, you know, what's, what's the birth date for the Ice Age? It's, there's not a time and a date. But I do think that this is a perfectly adequate one to use for now. It's the Sagittarius rising one. And if you look here to Pluto at 27 degrees of Capricorn, it takes 240 plus years for Pluto to go around the zodiac. And it goes around until it comes back to its birthplace. Now, the notion of planetary returns is actually one that everybody's familiar with, whether they know it or not. A lot of people have heard of Saturn returns. But a more common form of planetary returns is something we call the birthday. That's when the sun comes back around to where it was when you were born. And there's a sense of a regeneration with that, as though this is the start of a new chapter. When you're talking about something like a Pluto return, it's such a large cycle that when it comes back around for the first time in American history, from 1776 to the present, it's pretty uh, epic. It's, it's a major transformation, kind of a death rebirth sort of energy. Technically, it's coming to a head the next few years, 2022. Some astrologers who use a different framework, the sidereal framework, think it's 2024. Uh, it's, it's a moot point as far as I'm concerned because I give a very broad orb to that. I think the entire 2020s are really uh, affected by this Pluto return. And I'm going to do something a little bit different tonight talking about this. Uh, what I did a few years ago, actually last year, in June of last year, I wrote an article for the magazine I, I work for, a mountain astrologer. I wrote an article about the US Pluto return. And it was published in November of last year, in which I cited a bunch of points of what to expect in the next few years. What I'm going to do here is talk about, to a certain degree, read from that article. I normally wouldn't do that, except that I wrote this before what happened this year in terms of Black Lives Matter, the uprising of that anyway, uh, before the, the uh, pandemic, before the uh, stock market crash. And it's very easy to predict things in the past, so to speak, with 2020 hindsight. And I want to give a sense of how astrology can be used to look at cycles that are coming up and the way energies unfold according to the stars. And to do that in the article, what I did was I first went back to cultures that had been through Pluto returns before, because you have uh, societies like Rome and England that have been through several Pluto returns. And we can get some clues from how they went through those energies and experienced those Pluto returns. And let's start with Rome, which had two Pluto returns. If we use the 27 BCE date as the start of the empire, what I wrote was Pluto's first return occurred during the period around the years 2016 to 2023 AD. 
This was not surprisingly a period of instability and change associated with the Severan dynasty. The divisive and highly unpopular emperor, uh, Agalabalus, I'm not sure if that's the pronunciation, reigned between 2018 and 2022 AD. And his rule became notorious for sex scandals, religious controversies, and various outrageous behaviors, including the infamous banquet where he allegedly smothered guests by flooding the room with rose petals. After he and his mother were dragged through the streets and assassinated by the Praetorian Guard, his reign was followed by that of Alexander Severus, who ruled from 2022 to 2035 AD. Though Severus restored some semblance of moderation to the empire, he too fell out of favor with his troops and was assassinated along with his mother, thereby marking the end of the Severan dynasty. His death in 235 AD is viewed as the pivotal event signaling the start of the crisis of the third century, where a succession of briefly reigning military emperors, rebellious generals, and counter claimants presided over governmental chaos, civil war, general instability, and economic disruption. So you can start to see a pattern here. As far as it's, there's turmoil, there tends to be changing of the guards, so to speak. And then we go to the second Pluto return for the Roman Empire, which took place in the years around 461 AD to 468 AD, which was a period of turmoil during which the empire found itself increasingly threatened by forces at its borders. Several years before, in 455 AD, the Vandals entered and sacked Rome itself. While at the Battle of Cap Bon in 468 AD, the Vandals destroyed a combined Western and Roman invasion fleet, but it was several years later, during the reign of the barbarian Flavius Odoacer, from 476 to 493 AD, that the Roman Empire collapsed altogether. In short, both of the general periods associated with the empire's Pluto returns re represented dramatic periods of change, power struggles, and political instability. But it's important to note it was only with the second of those returns that the empire finally collapsed. In and of itself, in other words, a Pluto return doesn't necessarily portend the demise of a nation, although it does always seem to involve considerable upheaval. There's been a lot of concern over whether the U.S. Pluto return was going to be the fall of the American, uh, the United States empire. It doesn't mean that necessarily, but it does certainly show a, a reformulation, a rebirth, a reinvention, you might say. Now, let's go to England, which has actually had three, uh, <laughs> three Pluto returns since uh, 1066 when William the Conqueror was uh, coronated on December 25th, the birth of modern England, according to some uh, researchers. The first of those returns occurred around the years 1311 to 1355 AD. I give a very broad birth to these things. It's actually longer than just those few years, but I'm trying to single in on what I think are the key points there. The second of those returns around the years ranging from 1555 to 1562, while the last of those Pluto returns unfolded around the years ranging from 1801 to 1810. Note that I say around the years, since it's important to also allow a wide orb for Pluto aspects due to its exceptionally long orbital period. I have some disagreement with uh, my astrological colleagues, some of them anyway, on this point where I don't think you can pinpoint something like a Pluto return to a single year or two. I think we almost have to give 10 years on either side because remember we're talking about a 240 plus year cycle. It's quite long. So the effects of that build up quite a long time ahead of it and linger very long afterwards. Now the first of those time frames, 1311 to 1315, that was a period of major environmental problems, most likely, most notably in the so-called Great Famine, which began in 1315 and caused enormous social unrest for years to come and resulted in the deaths of millions. And as my colleague Kenneth Bowser pointed out, 1314 saw the pivotal victory of Robert the Bruce at the Battle of Bannockburn, signaling the separation of the Scots from England. 
thanks to uh, Kenneth for that. The period around England's second Pluto return, which was roughly around 1555 to 1562, was a key turning point in the empire's history in various ways. In addition to a major insurrection in Kent in 1554 and the widespread persecution of Protestants in 1555, this period saw the ascension to the throne of Queen, Queen Mary I, who reigned from 15. 53 to her death in 1558, making her the very first non-jointly ruling female monarch of England. That was followed by the ascension of Elizabeth I to the throne in 1558, which was a time of high drama for both her and the nation, bracketed on one end by the beheading of Elizabeth's mother, Anne Boleyn, and the famed standoff between Elizabeth and Mary, Queen of Scots, on the other. Now here's a famous painting, a beautiful painting, of our Queen Elizabeth and John Dee uh, performing some kind of ritual for uh, Queen Elizabeth. Perhaps most significant of all, this period inaugurated the so-called Elizabethan era, regarded now as a golden age in English history and literature, and characterized by such luminaries as William Shakespeare, Ben Jonson, Christopher Marlowe, and Edmund Spencer. Elizabeth's reign was also associated with the famed astrologer, mathematician, and occultist John Dee, the individual credited with actually coining the term British Empire. In several respects, this period was indeed a Plutonian rebirth for England, insofar as Elizabeth took an essentially bankrupt economy and restored fiscal responsibility to it while overseeing a great surge in global expansion and ushering in a period of relative stability and internal peace to the country. But underlying that relative peace and stability were serious problems, among them long-standing animosities between Catholics and Protestants that simmered below the surface and led to several assassination attempts on Elizabeth's life. England's third Pluto return occurred in the period around 1801 to 1810. Aside from this being the general time frame associated with the Industrial Revolution, 1801 specifically saw the formal creation of the United Kingdom when Great Britain, England, Wales, and Scotland joined forces with Ireland, arguably a profound, as profound a transition point in English history as any other. And whereas 1801 witnessed the end of England's commercial boom, 1809 saw a fiscal regeneration with the start of a new economic boom, a true Plutonian rebirth of sorts. During this general period, England also found itself embroiled in various military conflicts in the effort to hold its empire together, including the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805, the Napoleonic Wars from 1803 to 1815, the Peninsula War from 1808 to 1814, the Anglo-Russian War from 1807 to 1812, the Anglo-Swedish War in 1810, and the 1812 conflict with the newly independent United States. So it was a time of turmoil, but it also was another period of rebirth. It's also, like I said, associated with the after effects of the Industrial Revolution. Now this is kind of curious. Uh, this period also saw the British monarchy becoming increasingly unpopular and even played host to the famed madness of King George when the head of the empire was himself slipping in and out of dementia, having been formally recognized as insane in 1810. It's tempting to consider that the king's condition may well have symbolized a deeper imbalance festering within the empire itself, perhaps referring, reflecting the darker stirrings of Pluto. But there is another development around this period of English history that is easily overlooked and which may be crucial to understanding America's own Pluto return. To see that, though, we need to step back and look at something that began under England's Pluto, previous Pluto return, and which came to an end under this third one. I'm referring here to the fact that during the earlier reign of Elizabeth I, the empire saw the formal inauguration of its slave trade under the direction of Sir John Hawkins, truly the nefarious shadow side of that era's so-called golden age. Then, more than two centuries later, it officially came to an end, the slave trade, during Pluto's next return, with the passing of the abolition of the Slave Act of 1807. 
although actually it was a longer term process of uh, abolishing the slave trade, but that's a pivotal year, directly in the midst of England's third Pluto return. It's not difficult to see the Plutonian character of this development in both positive and negative respects. On the one hand, the slave trade showed England acting out the darkest impulses of human nature with all its bigotry, cruel, cruelty, and greed. Then the abolition of slavery during England's third Pluto return revealed England in a more redemptive and cathartic light as the nation struggled coming to terms with that bloody institution. Pluto transits often involve contending with some unresolved darkness or transgression from the past. And if one truly confronts and resolves those issues, the effect can indeed be transformative. If not, though, those unresolved issues can consume and destroy from within. Fortunately, under that third Pluto return, England shows to confront and finally abandon that legacy. So what are the implications here for the United States? I have a, what I do is I'm going to list seven primary points that I think we need to be looking at. And I remember I wrote this last year, and it was published in around November. One effect of the Pluto return for America will almost certainly be economic. In doing research for this article, I thought it might be helpful to look back at what happened during America's half return of Pluto during the mid 1930s, when it reached 27 cancer and hoped that that might provide some symbolic hints as to what the full Pluto return will bring. Now again, remember, when I wrote this, the economy was doing pretty good. See here, the half return, I'm going to laser point this, that's where Pluto is in the birth chart of the United States. It goes all the way around and then it comes to this point here where it's opposing the natal point. That's like a, like a full moon sort of energy. And it kind of produces a recapitulation of the natal Pluto. Now, the funny thing is that Pluto's orbital cycle is 240 plus years. But because the, the orbital plane of, of Pluto is so erratic, it takes a very short time for the latter part of this return, in other words, to make the full process at 240 some years. And yet, that Half return occurred in the 30s, which is only, what, 70 years ago, 70, 80 years ago in that ballpark. While that technically became exact in the mid-30s, its influence extended for a number of years on either side. The 1930s represented the very midst of the Great Depression, when Americans were facing privations and anxieties they'd rarely experienced before. While we may not experience anything quite on that scale again under the coming return, there are enough troublesome indicators already in play to believe it will be a turbulent time for the U.S. economy. It's good to remember, though, not everyone was affected equally or in the same way by the Great Depression. In fact, some individuals actually became quite wealthy during that period, which simply goes to show that seemingly difficult planetary energies can manifest quite differently for different individuals. The second point that I raised based not only on those earlier Pluto returns of Rome and England, but on what we already see happening in the US, it's also safe to say we can expect to see a growing mood of social unrest in the country, bordering, possibly bordering on a Civil War type atmosphere. Notice I say type. Do I personally believe that that could result in an actual Civil War with neighbors shooting and attacking one another? While even a few politicians have hinted at that possibility, I think that's highly unlikely. But there's little question there will be strong and potentially violent emotions bubbling up to the surface these next few years. I laugh because when I wrote this, it really didn't seem likely, and now it's looking pretty likely. What could possibly trigger such an extreme level of anger and unrest? Well, let me count the ways. In addition to hot button issues like abortion, immigration, political corruption, and income inequality, it's likely that whoever wins the next presidential election will elicit a firestorm of reaction on the opposite side of the political, political divide. If Trump wins, that would trigger much frustration and anger amongst his detractors, while his loss certainly would not be taken well by his supporters either, to put it mildly. What's interesting, I didn't include this in the article, 
But this is the eclipse that happened in 2017, where the eclipse shadow sliced across the US. And a lot of astrologers were looking at this and saying, does this mean there's going to be a divide in the US, in the United States over the next few years? Because the effects of eclipses, like any major pattern, like a Pluto return for that matter, takes years to unfold. It doesn't happen on the date or the year necessarily. And so this, I think, reinforces a lot of what's going on in the country uh, in connection with the Pluto return. Let's see the date on this, I believe. August of 2017 is when that was. As I pointed out during its last Pluto return, England was embroiled in a number of military conflicts in various parts of the world. And it's possible America could likewise find itself embroiled in one or more conflicts too whether that involve Iran, Korea, Venezuela, or another country. But considering the more covert, even underhanded side of Pluto, this could just as easily manifest through acts of sabotage, terrorism, or cyber terrorism directed at the US rather than conventional battlefield conflicts. We saw a striking example of Pluto at work in the events of 9-11, when there was a major Pluto opposed Saturn energy. When the attack itself may have been out in the open, but per the, the perceived enemy seemed almost anonymous. Where was the terrorism being directed from exactly, and how could we respond? Americans felt a nearly paralyzing sense of powerlessness in their ability to get a clear grip on the situation, its perpetrators, or a possible solution. In fact, that sense of powerlessness is one of the key signatures of challenging Pluto aspects. While I hope the United States doesn't experience anything along those lines again, that possibility can't be entirely dismissed. And we even need to consider the possibility of a false flag attack, in which a perceived act of foreign terrorism is actually orchestrated from within the US to serve some homegrown political or militaristic purpose. Now we haven't had, there haven't been any overt war, wars in the sense of, you know, we have, well, we have attacked Iran in January. There have been some smaller skirmishes. Now, whether these things are going to blow up into larger scale conflicts the next few years, we'll see. It could also be economic warfare, by the way. It doesn't have to be, you know, guns and cannons and bombs. Falling as it does in Capricorn, the impending Pluto returns strongly points to explosive scandals or falls from grace involving prominent individuals, be those politicians, celebrities, religious authorities, or business leaders. Previously hidden corruption, including sex crimes or possibly even treasonous activities, will be exposed to the light of day. Will that extend to the very highest political office of the land, i.e. the president? Impossible to know for sure, but it will undoubtedly be a challenging time for whoever is occupying the Oval Office at the time, whether they be Republican or Democrat. Now this year we've seen some interesting scandals kind of uh, blow open. There's the Epstein thing. There's the uh, Falwell scandal that happened. Uh, there, there's the one that happened with uh, Giuliani and uh, the actor playing uh, Barat, I think it's called, recently. Especially since the Pluto return is occurring in an Earth sign, another likely impact will be environmental in nature in terms of problems with the land and agriculture. Archetypally speaking, Pluto governs such things as toxins, refuse, and hazardous materials. So it's not unthinkable our country's problem with pollution can reach a tipping point, and that we will be forced to come to grips with the poisons in our food that result from fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides. Oil spills or problems with nuclear fuel sources are always a possibility, so that could be added to the mix. As before, I wondered whether we might find some useful clues from the earlier half return of Pluto and was struck by the fact that the mid-1930s also witnessed the uh, infamous Dust Bowl, which was a natural calamity affecting millions of Americans, but precipitated in large part by human-made agricultural practices. Interesting, while that condition lasted throughout the entire decade, it climaxed almost precisely with the uh, almost precisely with the exact Pluto half return. This is from a Wikipedia description of that time. Severe drought hit the Midwest and Southern Great Plains in 1930. Massive storms began in 1931. A series of drought years followed, further exacerbating the environmental disaster. 
By 1934, an estimated 35 million acres of formerly cultivated land had been rendered useless for farming, while another 125 million acres, an area roughly three quarters the size of Texas, was rapidly losing its topsoil. Regular rainfall returned to the region by the end of 1939, bringing the Dust Bowl years to a close. The economic effects, however, persisted. Population declines in the worst hit counties, where the agricultural value of the land failed to recover, continued well into the 1950s. The worst dust storm occurred on April 14, 1935, which is right smack dab on that uh, Pluto half return. An Associated Press News report coined the term Dust Bowl after the Black Sunday dust storm. That's a picture from the period. While we may not actually experience another Dust Bowl, exactly, it's a good possibility we'll be dealing with environmental problems that impact our farms and our food supply in the coming years. To some ex uh, extent, of course, that's already happening due to severe flooding and fires in large portions of the Midwestern and Western states, which has led some agricultural experts to predict food prices could skyrocket over the next few years. The effects of hurricanes on the southern and southeastern states are also a possibility to consider. Now, these are the fires that just happened out in California, which has been burning up, and the flooding that's occurred because of the hurricanes and other factors, the rainfalls in some areas, has been very severe, and this, so this could snowball in the next few years. It could continue to happen, if not get worse. This is an article that came out in March of this year, just the headline maybe, uh, mainly, study points to dangerous, dangerous a possible new dust bowl. Another effect that strikes me as worth mentioning centers around the growing threat of autocracy. It's no secret Pluto can behave quite di dictatorially at times, and we've already started seeing signs of that, not only in Donald Trump's unabashedly forceful style, but in the rise of various far-right neo-fascist elements throughout the country. While it's true that we've been seeing the rise of strongman-type governments in several countries besides the US in recent years, that's more likely due to the influence of the current Saturn-Pluto conjunction in Capricorn, along with the fact that transiting Pluto has been opposing its 1930 discovery point of 17 cancer in recent years, too. Even here, I was surprised to find intriguing parallels from the, that period of America's half-return of Pluto in the 1930s. Though now largely forgotten, in America in the 1930s saw the rise of various pro-fascist groups around the country, including the Silver Shirts, Black Legion, Khaki Shirts, and Fascist League movements. While for the most part this trend remained outside the mainstream, it received support from no less prominent figures than Ezra Pound and Charles Lindbergh. That's a shot of Madison Square Garden and a pro-Nazi rally that occurred in the 30s. Uh, Americans and German-Americans joining forces to uh, support the emerging fascist uh, Nazi uh, movement. And in 1934, very close to the exact Pluto return, according to tropical standards, the U.S. came perhaps the closest it's ever come to a true fascist coup d'etat, when democracy was nearly subverted by a cabal of wealthy individuals and businessmen, but prevented by Major General, General Smedley Butler. As one article described it, Fascism had reared its head in Europe, and the world had yet to make up its mind what it thought about it. That would come later in World War II. Many thought that the best way to pull America out of the Great Depression was to install a dictator. Even the New York Herald Tribune read a headline, ran a headline called, For Dictatorship If Necessary. Although the newspaper's article was in support of FDR, a group of wealthy financiers believed that America should indeed have a dictator. So they began to plot a coup d'etat that would later come to be known as the business plot or the Wall Street putsch. It's startling to realize that had it not been for General Butler, America could have gone in a dramatically different direction during the 1930s, similar to Germany. So with Pluto now coming up to its first full return, does this mean that an elected candidate, Trump or otherwise, will try to exert even greater control over our country's government? A related possibility that could be that Trump loses the election but simply refuses to abdicate the Oval Office, thus creating a constitutional crisis, 
Or could it simply mean that wealthy plutocrats will consolidate their already formidable, formidable control over the country, such as through more corporate, corporate friendly legislative measures and judicial appointments? I just this morning heard an interesting discussion on the radio about uh, how tricky the next few months are. If we have a democratic presidency, but if the Senate remains Republican and in the midterms the House becomes Republican, we're going to have a very conflicted government with you know, two very different forces butting heads and perhaps getting nowhere, but it could be that that Pluto has a lot to do with that internal conflict that I hinted at before with England. The last possibility, and I think the most important one, that I want to touch on harkens back to what happened with England during the early 19th century. What darkness from our own past will we be contending with these next few years? It seems clear on one level anyway, it's similar to that of England during the early 1800s, namely the legacy of slavery. America was built on it, the nation's economy thrived because of it, and while the institution itself was officially discontinued, we're still coming to terms with its legacy and all that it implied. Racism, bigotry, greed. Slavery and racism have long been a stain on the nation's soul, and though we've tried hard to deny that history, it's becoming increasingly hard to avoid. There's even been talk in the US these last couple of years about the feasibility of reparations and making amends to America's black population for slavery. While I think that's unlikely to happen strictly from a legislative standpoint, the timing is, is certainly fitting in light of Pluto returning to its founding degrees. As usual, I often look to cinema for symbolic clues into the shifting zeitgeist, and in that spirit I was especially struck by the blockbuster horror film Us, released in March of this year, 2019. To my mind, the movie presented an uncanny illustration of America's impending Pluto return in terms of contending with that legacy of racism. Aside from the fact that its writer-director was himself black, along with most of the film's actors. The movie focuses on America's coming face to face with that underworldly shadow side, literally underworldly as if you've seen the film, and with the hidden darkness that has been simmering beneath our nation's sunny surfaces for too long. I don't want to give away too much about the plot for those who haven't seen it, but for those who would like to see a more imaginative depiction of America's impending Pluto return, I highly recommend watching it with an astrologer's perspective in mind. Also note how one of the shadow children in the movie is even named Pluto. Now that's the, the uh, poster for the film, but another film that, uh, 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 HBO film that came out that I think touches on this a lot, is the uh, latest filming of Watchmen which is a very interesting production, multi-part production, that not only was prescient in terms of showing everybody wearing masks, but the opening episode, which I recommend, highly recommend you watch, uh, if only to see the, the quite moving depiction of the Tulsa massacre of, um, I forget the year, 1923 perhaps, but it brings that to light in a way that uh, I haven't seen before in the mass media. Uh, a lot of people have known about the Tulsa race massacre, but to see it presented that way uh, in, a, in a movie production was, was very powerful. Nor is this impending challenge solely about America's black population. The Pluto return also seems related to our natural discussion around minorities in general, and our culture's uneasy relationship with Muslims, Native Americans, Asian Americans, Latinos, and the LGBTQ community. Previously repressed elements of our population, including women, of course, now seem poised to make their voices heard in ways like never before, something which became especially evident in the latest US midterm elections. These are some of the women that uh, Native American, Asian American, black, uh, Muslim, et cetera. It was quite a shift. It's, it's not a question of whether you agree with their politics or not. It's the symbolism of what we're seeing here and how it relates to the um, Pluto return. 
The influence of Pluto was also apparent in our national debate over immigration and the ongoing crisis involving Mexican and Central American refugees at our southern border. Here, too, there are fascinating parallels with what unfolded in America during the 1930s. While researching this article, I was surprised to learn about the following controversy from that earlier time. Most Americans are familiar with the forced relocation in 1942 of 112,000 Japanese Americans from the West Coast to internment camps. Far fewer are aware that during the Great Depression, the Federal Bureau of Immigration after, after 1933 called the Immigration and Naturalization Service, along with local authorities, routed up Mexican immigrants and naturalized Mexican American citizens and shipped them to Mexico to resume, reduce relief roles. In, in a shameful episode, more than 400,000 repatriados, many of them citizens of the United States by birth, were sent across the U.S.-Mexico border from Arizona, California, and Texas. Texas Mexican-born population was reduced by a third. Los Angeles also lost a third of its Mexican population. And I think this ties in with what we've been seeing the last few years about the concern over immigration and, you know, the, the, the separating families at the uh, border and all this. On an archetypal level, this is going a little deeper into, I think, the symbolism, much of this anxiety over immigrants and minorities seems rooted in a deeper fear or even hatred of the other and a disdain for all those existing outside our own familiar tribe. One of Pluto's painful secrets seems to be just this. The hatred we direct towards others is actually self-hatred, projected outward. Once we become conscious of that dynamic, it becomes possible to transmute those emotions, and the result is genuine transformation and rebirth. But that takes considerable self-awareness, courage, and intelligence, qualities that seem to be in short supply amongst many Americans these days. Some timing considerations. As for when these dynamics can be expected to start manifest, the Pluto return is technically set to fire exactly on February 22nd of 2022, and by precession adjusted standards, which is a different framework that some astrologers use, February of 2024. As I hinted at the outset, though, a long-term cycle like this, Pluto return, requires an exceptionally wide orb of influence on either side. So as with both Rome and England, the long-range effects of this cycle necessarily extend for many years before and after that window of exactitude. Indeed, I don't think it would be excess excessive to speak of the entire 2020s as representing the peak period of America's Pluto return. In fact, in terms of its early influence, it's therefore clear to me that it's already being felt and has been for quite some time, actually. I'd even suggest that we were permitted an early sneak preview, an omen, you might say, of that influence when Pluto first went into Capricorn back in 2008. Did anything of importance happen then which correlates to or foreshadowed what we're talking about thus far and what's going on in the United States right now? Well, two things. First of all, you had the massive stock market drop in 2008. And then you had the election of the first black American president, which I think is an uncanny sort of foreshadowing of the issues that are happening now. Besides a major tremor in America's economy that year, the United States elected its first black American president, Barack Hussein Obama. He was elected in November of 2008, but assumed office in January of 2009. I can hardly think of a clearer symbol of America's having to come face to face with its legacy of racism and slavery and general uneasiness towards the other than the election of a black president with a Muslim sounding name. I also believe that the Saturn Pluto conjunction, which will become exact in January of 2020, this last January, in other words, will likewise serve as an early trigger for the US Pluto return, and that much of what we're already seeing in the country in terms of unrest over Trump, immigration policies, abortion, partisan loyalties, and racism, and I would add economic uh, turbulence, is directly intertwined with that larger Pluto return. That Pluto-Saturn aspect that happened in the second week of January of this year was a very powerful energy 
that triggered a lot of what we see happening this year in terms of the COVID, in terms of the economy, in terms of the, uh, the racist issues. And it is kind of like a, a sneak preview of the Pluto return in some ways, I would suggest. Like, for example, this year we had the crash. But as noted, the U.S. Pluto return will technically not be exact till February of 2022, technically. It's important to remember that alignments like this are similar to new moons in that they re rep represent the initiation of new cycles and as such plant seeds that continue developing long afterwards. So while it's possible there could be some important symbolic seed events happening around that month, the full effects of America's Pluto return will probably not reveal themselves for years, possibly even decades afterwards, in the various areas explored here. And that's both for positive and negative. For example, the Elizabethan Golden Age did not happen right at the Pluto return. It unfolded in the decades afterwards. So by the same token, I think there's going to be positive and negative with the Pluto return, and we may see a lot of the positive coming out in the next few years, the next few decades, possibly into you know, the next century or two. On a final note, it's important to note that while the U.S. Pluto return will likely prove challenging in various ways, a configuration like this presents powerful opportunities as well. In that regard, it's good to remember that despite the problems which attended England's second Pluto return, that period eventually became one of its culturally richest. In turn, England's third Pluto return witnessed both a decline and a rebounding of its economy. As for the tangle of issues we already see coming to a boil in the U.S., one can think of it in much the same way that health practitioners talk about the detox crises a body goes through after a long buildup of poison before it can become well again. We've been seeing just such a toxic buildup of America's social, political, economic, and environmental issues these last few years, and all that, and that could all intensify these next few years. Will we confront and resolve those problems and emerge from this period a newly reinvigorated and healed society, having survived the death-rebirth dynamic of Pluto? One way or another, we'll be finding out soon enough. Now, I have quite a bit more to say here. Uh, this is Donald Trump's horoscope. I do feel like I should address this a little bit, and I'm going to do it, I hope, in a nonpartisan fashion here. Let me uh, use the laser pointer here to... One of the key patterns that I've written about, I have an article online, if you look up Donald Trump and the Saturn-Pluto conjunction, you'll find it. I talk a lot about his Saturn-Venus conjunction, which is, a, I think, a, a key to deciphering Donald Trump and his chart, for better and worse. Um, and by the same token, I remember when I looked at Bill Clinton's horoscope back in the early 90s and I pointed out the good, but I also pointed out the sex addiction tendencies in the chart and my uh, colleagues got angry at me for focusing on that. But I'm trying to be, you know, show all the facets of these things. The Saturn-Pluto conjunction you see in the charts of a lot of very wealthy people. Jeff Bezos has it, Bill Gates has it, Mark Zuckerberg has the opposition. Uh, John D. Rockefeller Jr. has a conjunction. But it also shows some pretty intense issues around rejection, loneliness, unpopularity. It's like the kid that feels left out of the party, so to speak. And that's been triggered very strongly, as I wrote about in that blog from Out in Astrologer. It's been triggered very strongly this last year. And so, for example, the Pluto-Saturn conjunction that I mentioned that happened in January has been more or less dancing back and forth all year opposing that point, which has been triggering major issues for Trump economically, politically, and now recently the loss of the election. And um, I think that this is triggering some very primal emotions for him, could be possibly traumatic for him, and who knows how this is going to play out. But the energies are continuing into next year. I'm going to give you a few dates to watch here. And again, I'm not saying this from a standpoint of pro or anti-Trump. I'm just talking about stress points like you can with anybody's horoscope. For example, we have something coming right up uh, around Jan uh, December 20th and 21st. Pluto opposes Trump's natal Saturn. In other words, Pluto is going to be down here forming an exact opposition to his natal Saturn, a half return of Saturn. 
which is pretty hard, but it's triggering that whole pattern there, the Saturn-Venus pattern, right on the heels of the uh, Saturn hitting the uh, Pluto. Now, the reason that's so significant around that December 20th, 21st date, it's also the timing of a major planetary conjunction in the sky of Saturn is conjuncting Jupiter for the first time in many years, several decades, in zero degrees Aquarius. It's also the same date as the, uh, basically the same date as the uh, winter solstice. And on top of that, Mars is going to be in a square formation to where Saturn and Pluto were on, in January of this year. There's a lot happening right around that third week or so of December, so watch that very closely. I think it could bring things to a head politically. You could give a few days on either side of that, of course. And a couple of dates next year you want to watch in terms of stress points for Trump would be February 18th, give or take five days on either side. That's when Pluto opposes his Venus. That tends to expose things to the light of day, especially economic issues. March 16th, Saturn opposes uh, his Pluto. Going a little further, he's got Neptune squaring his sun next year. That's a whole other thing we don't have time to get into. Pluto opposes his Venus July 10th, give or take a few days. And the Pluto station point around October 6th is a major trigger. October 10th, the Saturn, right up piggybacking on the Pluto station point, the Saturn station point. Um, a lot happening for him next year. Even into December 25th, Christmas Day of next year, Pluto opposes his Venus. So he's riding the rapids for this next year. He has been this year, and it's not going to be over with any time soon. Now, let me go into some of the broader implications of what uh, all this is about. What I'm saying to recap some of this is that the Pluto return for the U.S. signals a kind of a soul-searching period for the U.S., a kind of a reinvention of America and what it represents. It's taking stock of where we've come and where we're going. And like I said earlier, it has a lot to do with looking at the darkness from the past, the unresolved issues from the past, the mistakes of the past. And America can take that, America can take that one of two ways. It can either come to grips with it like... Uh, Britain did during its third Pluto return, or it can just shove it underground and then it explodes out in other ways. You know, that remains to be seen. We have free will in terms of how we're going to deal with it. And it's part of a larger discussion. I've spoken a lot in my lectures here about the Great Ages and about the shifting from the age of Pisces to the age of Aquarius. And I think all major wars, all major battles, be they militaristic or political, to some extent represent, especially if they happen at the cusp between ages, they represent the acting out of that sort of dynamic of the birth pangs of a new age. And to a certain degree, I think what we're going through is acting out the birth pangs of a new kind of group dynamic. Aquarius is groups. It's group intelligence. It's how the individual fits in with the group. So there's this very heavy discussion about, let's say, democracy versus fascism, uh, socialism versus uh, capitalism. It's a sense of uh, how are we going to come to terms with balancing these things out, because I don't think it can be one extreme or the other. It may continue to be a pendulum back and forth for quite some time. For example, I've often spoken about the way that the abortion debate is a symbol of that transitional issue. And I'm not, I'm not taking a pro-life or pro-choice here. I'm talking archetypal symbolism here. The pro life faction tends to be more Christian-based, which makes it more Piscean age-based. That doesn't make it bad, it's just different. The pro-choice faction, it tends to be more Aquarian in terms of personal independence, freedom, that sort of thing, and secular values. Pisces is definitely a religious sort of age. Aquarius is more of a secular age. There may be religion, but it's not the, the dominant force. And the acting out of that uh, pro-life, pro-choice battle, I think, is a symbol of that. And we're seeing that to some extent in what's happening right now in the American body politic. As far as, if you look at the one side, it tends to be more 
religious, Christian-based, uh, as well as behind that even oil-based. There's a heavy emphasis on the oil industry, which is Neptune. That's a Piscean force. Whereas the other side tends to be more Aquarian in terms of things like solar power. That's the Leo-Aquarius opposition. Tends to be more uh, secular. It tends to be about more personal rights and that sort of thing. So I think that, and, and I can't say exactly how that's going to play out. Though usually the incoming age wins out over the, the outgoing age. But I think that that's the deeper dynamic of what's happening here. And it has a lot to do with the group dynamic affects the individual dynamic. And what I mean by that is that there's a shift taking place in how we see ourselves. There's a shift taking place in you know, how do we regard individuals? How do we regard the individual psyche? There's been a lot of changes in the last century due to psychology and uh, changes in uh, the political system about our value, our self-worth as individuals. And if I can uh, close on a more spiritual note, it's easier said than done, but if you talk to spiritual teachers, one of the things that you hear consistently is this idea of don't get too caught up in the external drama. Don't get caught up in the maya. And like I said, that's easier said than done, and that's easier for me to, to preach than it is to practice. But it can be done, and I know that there's a, a, a blowback on that, a pushback from people who say, if you don't get too riled up about what's happening, you won't be inclined to be an activist, or you'll get too passive, or you'll kind of uh, stand back and let the world you know, go down, circle down the drain, which isn't true. And I'll, I'll relate a personal anecdote that I think underscores that. Years ago, I was driving down the road nearby here in this area, and I saw something which you never want to see. It was really a horrific situation where, uh, without going into too many details, uh, a young kid on a bike rode out into a traffic and was hit by a fast-moving vehicle. And it was an incredibly shocking thing to see. And there were many other cars around and people standing around. And everybody was more or less paralyzed with shock. We just couldn't believe what we had seen. It was so horrific. But one lady got out of her car and calmly uh, uh, delivered, if that's the word, first aid to the kid, took care of the kid. She had been an emergency room nurse. So she was used to dealing with crises. She was used to dealing with traumas, uh, tragedies even. And yet she was cool, calm, and collected. And yet it didn't make her passive. It didn't make her stand back and just you know, watch the kid, you know, the life, uh, leave him. He did survive, by the way. And I think that that was a real lesson for me, because it, it really told me that you don't have to be upset to make a difference. You don't have to be emotionally caught up in something to get out there and march or to make a difference in the, in the world. And I think that that's what the spiritual teachers are saying to a large extent, that you can be active, but you can also you know, keep your equanimity, not get too caught up in the Maya. So that's pretty much it. I want to wrap this up. Uh, the article is, if you can't get your hands on the article that I was reading from, I did put it into my book, Stargates. I modified it a little bit. I fleshed it out with a few more historical details. But uh, the entire article is in that book. So I want to thank you for listening. Namaste.